This is our second sermon in this short series on the epistle to Philemon. This letter that would have accompanied Tychicus and Onesimus as they were delivering the letter to the Colossian church. Now, last week we noted how Paul spends much of his time in this letter kind of warming up to the big ask, the big request of this letter that is found in verse 17, where Paul's big goal is to have Philemon welcome this runaway bond slave back into the household and into the church. Paul wants Philemon to welcome Onesimus as if he were welcoming Paul himself. But we are still warming up to that big request here in, in today's passage, too. But even in this warming up phase, we've already learned some valuable lessons, haven't we? For instance, we've been reminded of the fact that our individual actions often have very corporate implications. Not corporate in the sense of the business world, but corporate in the sense of the church life. What we do as individual Christians, how we handle our problems, how we interact with, with others, reflects on Christ and his church. That's why we noted how this letter here, this personal letter to Philemon is anything but private. It's intended to be read to the entire church because the whole church has a stake in how this all plays out in relation to Philemon's treatment of Onesimus. <coughs> Excuse me. How Philemon handles this is going to send out ripples, ripples throughout the entire church and indeed throughout the Colossian community. And so it is with you and me. How we handle our individual issues. We are not islands unto ourselves, are we? No, we are part of a body of believers that corporately represents Jesus. And we see that in the opening greetings of this letter. We also learn, though, from Paul's prayer for Philemon, a lesson in how we can experience every good thing. That's Paul's terminology there in verse 6. Every good thing that God has in store for his people. Paul's prayer, remember, in verses 4 through 6, reminds Philemon and reminds us, you will only experience all the good things God has in store for you in an ongoing, deepening community with other believers. Now, as you think about that idea, it's one thing to acknowledge that, right? To see, okay, I get that. Part of God's plan for me as a Christian is to be meaningfully engaged with other Christians, to go, deepening in my, to go deeper in my koinonia, my, my fellowship, my shared life with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I get that. It's another thing to actually do it, though, isn't it? It's another thing to actually meaningfully engage in that kind of koinonia, to open your life up to fellow sinners saved by grace. It's another thing to actually deal with the messiness and the complications and, and the baggage that often accompanies those kinds of interactions. That's the case for Philemon here. Paul is about to, to show him what his next opportunity for a greater experience of God in his life is going to look like. And what's it going to look like? It's going to look like welcoming back into his household this guy who betrayed him. This guy who from later verses, it's suggested, stole from him. And so it's going to be complicated. It's going to be a challenge for a number of reasons. It's a tall order for Philemon. And it's going to be a tall order for us as, as the rubber meets the road, as we seek to, again, go deeper into our communion with one another, knowing that on the other side of that, we'll experience more of God and everything he has for us. Now, our focus here today is on verses 8 through 16, where Paul is continuing to lay the groundwork building up to the request. Today's passage contains the story of Onesimus' conversion and of Paul's role in it and of Paul's new perspective regarding Onesimus. And through it all, we continue to see the gospel in action. We see it informing Paul's approach and changing Onesimus' life. And of course, Paul's hope is that this will also change Philemon's perspective toward Onesimus. But there are three key themes that I see in this passage here today. Three themes that I want us to focus on from these nine verses. And they are, 
first of all, the motivation the gospel brings. I want us to think about the motivation the gospel brings, firstly. Secondly, I want us to think about the transformation the gospel produces, the transformation. And then thirdly, the liberation, the liberation that the gospel gives. And in verses 8 through 10, then, we're going to look at the motivation the gospel brings. Accordingly, Paul writes in verse 8, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Notice Paul's approach here. He is not flashing his apostolic badge he is not asserting his authority. He is trying to appeal to Philemon to show a little grace toward him, to sympathize with his plight, to appreciate the fact that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that he's an older man, that he looks at Onesimus as if he were now his own child, even in imprisonment. One could say that Paul is not pulling rank here, then, in verses 8 through 10. Instead, he's pulling on the heartstrings, isn't he? He's pulling on the heartstrings. But as we've mentioned already, and we'll mention again in our next study, this is not manipulation. Manipulation is based on falsehood. This is all absolute truth. This is real. This is what Paul was experiencing. This is where he was at in life. But in doing this, in, in appealing to Philemon in this way, rather than asserting his authority, in a way, if you think about it, he's kind of modeling for Philemon what he hopes Philemon will do. He hopes Philemon will not assert his authority, but will instead look at this whole scenario through the eyes of compassion and communion. But he's also doing something here in this initial appeal that syncs up beautifully with the prayer that he just prayed. Remember, accordingly, here at the beginning of verse 8, signals to us that what he's saying here is related to what he just prayed over Philemon. And in that prayer, we saw that, that Paul was not just interested in Philemon doing the right thing. Paul's not just thinking in terms of tasks here and getting it done. He's thinking of the relationships involved. Yes, he wants Philemon to do the right thing, but he also wants Philemon to Notice, to experience every good thing himself. He doesn't want Philemon, in other words, just to do his Christian duty. He wants Philemon to experience the delight that comes from obeying God from the right perspective. He wants him to know the delight that comes as his faith and fellowship actuate into a changed perspective and a changed treatment of Onesimus. He could command it, yes, but instead he appeals. So Christian, when it comes to gospel-centered motivation, I encourage you to think this way, taking our cues from Paul's wording even here in these verses. Think appeal rather than command. Think appeal. When you come across various exhortations, admonitions, yes, even commands, even if they are worded in an in imperative fashion, think appeal rather than command, because that's really the heart of God behind those commands, isn't it? We, we know this, Romans 12, right? Romans 12, 1. I appeal, Paul writes to the Romans. It's the same word he uses here in Philemon, parakaleo. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, Paul doesn't want Philemon, and he doesn't want any Christian, to begrudgingly relent to God's will. He wants them to trustingly obey. It's the difference between an obligation and an opportunity. An opportunity to know God better. An opportunity to experience more of God's power. An opportunity to lay up more treasure in heaven. Paul wants his readers to see that whatever God commands us to do is for our good and for our everlasting joy. He wants believers to see how the mercies of God 
reassure us of the fact that God has been at work in our lives, is at work in our lives, and promises yet to do more for his people, indeed, through all of eternity. The mercies of God reassure us that whatever we are called to do here in this life, in the end, will bring us the greatest joy. Whatever cross we are called to bear, whatever way in which we are called to deny ourselves, we can be sure that in doing so, we are actually saying yes to a greater joy for all of eternity. These instructions, these commands, let's remember, are coming from the one, as Paul reminds us in Romans 8, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. So whether we're talking about general principles by which God wants his sons and daughters to live, or a very specific request like the one we find here from Paul to Philemon, we know that whatever appeal is being made, again, is being made for our ultimate good. And thinking appeal rather than command, having that mindset is going to help you this week to remember that and trustingly obey. Secondly, this morning, in verses 11 through 12, we see the transformation the gospel produces. The transformation the gospel produces. Verse 10's kind of already warmed us up to this idea of a transformation. Paul wrote that he had become Philemon's father during his imprisonment whose father I became. Now we know that's not literally. He's speaking figuratively. He's speaking spiritually. But he's using terminology that reminds us of the fact that a radical change takes place when someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior. It is, it is a new birth. It is being born again, as John would describe it. But he's talking here, again, using this familial terminology, and he's showing that there is this new affection this new relationship between himself and Onesimus. The same familial affection that Paul uses, same terminology, he uses to describe his affection for Titus and Timothy, two of his closest, most productive, most committed colleagues in the faith. In Titus 1, verse 4, he writes to Titus, my true child, in a common faith. He describes Timothy to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4.17. I'm sending you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He calls Timothy his child directly in the letters to Timothy, and he describes him again to the Philippian Christians in Philippians 2.22. You know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son, that's the word child, the same word used in Philemon. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. You see, Paul doesn't throw this father-child termin terminology around loosely. He doesn't throw it around carelessly. It's something he reserves to describe the relationships of those closest to him. And now he's using it of Onesimus. What does that tell you? It tells you that a big change has taken place in the life of this man, right? Right? This runaway slave, this thief, is now being classified in the same way that Paul looks at Timothy and Titus, guys who have books of the Bible written about them. This is a big change. How big? Well, Paul tells us in verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. As you think then about the transformation that the gospel produces Think this way. Think from useless to useful. Paul uses a play on words here in the Greek that translates very well, very comfortably into English. Kind of retains that, that play on words. Onesimus had been akrestos, of no use, but now he is ukrestos, useful. Again, it's a funny little play on words that, again, translates well into the English. But just think about the fact that, as we saw last week, this letter, the, the letter to Philemon was read in front of the entire church, presumably with Onesimus standing right there. This was kind of his ticket back into fellowship with the, with the household of Philemon and into the Colossian church. Just think about what that may have sounded like in Onesimus' ears, 
You know, if let's say, let's say Joe Average gets saved and he comes into our church and he's there in the baptismal tank and, and I've got the mic and I'm introducing him and I say, you know, Joe, hey, when he first walked into this church, boy, that guy was useless. And now he's useful. Now, some of you might think to yourself, I, I think I know what Pastor Matt's trying to say, but that's, I really wish he wouldn't have put it that way, right? You'd be cringing inside. You might be thinking, what, what's, Paul, what are you doing here? You're killing me. You're, this poor Onesimus, he must have been cringing. I don't think he was. I don't think he was. This is, this is, not, this is not coming from the heart of someone who is, who is just maybe a little sloppy with his wording. Paul is, and Paul isn't like that, that crazy uncle in your family that doesn't have any filter, right? We all have an uncle or an aunt like that, right? Someone who doesn't have any filter. How many of you have that kind of person in your, in your extended family? Sure, right? If you're not raising your hand, it might be because you are unwittingly that crazy <laughs> uncle. Maybe you are that crazy aunt that doesn't have any filter, but, but that's not what's going on here. You see, Paul can talk this way for two reasons. First of all, this is his story too, right? Paul is the first to talk about himself in ways that readily acknowledges his uselessness prior to coming to faith in Christ. This is his story. In 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul acknowledges, he rejoices in the fact that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul is the one who talks about himself in these kinds of terms. That's why he can talk about others who, prior to coming to Christ, are, these are Paul's terms, enemies of God, dead in our trespasses and sins, worthless, unrighteous, condemned, uh, that may not be the most politically correct way of, of talking about a sinner's situation before he or she comes to faith in Christ, but, I get, but, but it's actually correct. It's theologically right. It's honest. And it's something a sinner needs to hear before he or she can truly appreciate God's saving grace. So Paul, again, is, this is his story. He would be the first to admit that he had been worse than useless, but by God's grace has now been made useful. So it is here with Onesimus. Secondly, Paul also really, truly loves Onesimus. In verse 12, he says, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I have a, I have a theory that this whole useless to useful terminology is one that Paul and Onesimus already have had many a laugh over. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I, I can't imagine that he... he He's using this play on words the first time here in his letter to Philemon. But instead, he's already said, you know, your name means useful, Onesimus, but you were useless. But now, by God's grace, you've, you've been made useful. And he was totally comfortable with that. Paul talks about here the, the way in which his, it's like he, he had this, this gut-wrenching experience in letting Onesimus go back to Colossae. Now, we have the translation here, heart, right? Sending my very heart. But it's actually, again, the word splankna, which means guts or bowels. The King James Version translates verse 12, Thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels. Now, again, I'm glad we use the word heart these days. But if you think about it, what Paul is saying here is, is really accurate. It's vivid. It's, it's like... It's gut-wrenching. It's like I feel eviscerated even in sending this man away because he is so beloved, so treasured, so useful. Now, how did all this come to pass? How did useless become useful? It came about through the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How exactly did Onesimus come to faith? We're not told. We'll have to wait till heaven to get that full story. I'm looking forward to hearing the full story because I wonder, like, what happened to this guy? He runs away from his master in Colossae, and he ends up basically the equivalent in that day and age of the other side of the world. And who does he run into? He runs into a very close friend of his master. And it's, frankly, the very best person he could have possibly run into. 
the Apostle Paul. Did he fall on hard times in Rome and realize, you know, I, I heard that Paul might be here. Maybe I'll, I'll look him up. Maybe he can help me. Or, or did he get somehow arrested for some minor infraction and end up there in the courts and, and look across and, and see Paul waiting to be tried and, and somehow connect with him? We don't know. I'm, I'm dying to know. But somehow, God brought those two men together. And as I think about that, as I think about the story of Onesimus, and we only have a little bit of it, but we have enough to, to draw some implications out of it, and the first thing I want you to see from Onesimus' story is how it serves as an invitation. It's an invitation. It is an invitation to all the runaways out there who have been running from God for any number of reasons and in any number of ways over the years. For those who have been exposed to the gospel, have been entreated by Christians to come and believe and follow Jesus. Onesimus' story is an invitation to you to stop running, to come to your senses like he did, and to call sin what it is, to realize that apart from God, really, you're worse than useless. You're lost. You're condemned. You're on your way to hell. You're in greater danger than you could possibly appreciate. Hell is real, and eternity is a long time. But know this, you're also loved more than you can possibly imagine. Because you are loved by the God against whom you've sinned. This perfect, holy God would much rather welcome you into his family, would much rather forgive you of your sin than send you to hell. And so he made a way possible for you to be forgiven by sending his son into this world to pay the price for your sin on a cruel, rugged cross. He raised that son from the dead so that you could be assured that God's promise to raise you from the dead can be trusted. And now he is offering new and everlasting life to you if you'll stop running and heed his invitation today. Onesimus' story is also a source of inspiration and hope. What I mean by that is that there's a powerful word here, not just for the Onesimuses or Onesimais, but for the Christians who are praying for them. For the family members, for the loved ones, for the friends whose hearts are broken for the lost condition of these precious people in their lives and have spent many a night, have shed many a tear praying for these runaways, these individuals who are resisting the, the call of the gospel, who have heard it all multiple, many times. Just, just imagine what it was like that day in Colossae. You know, they didn't have the internet. There weren't any Facebook posts. Philemon couldn't say, hey everybody, Onesimus is back. And you're walking into... You're walking into church there at Philemon and Aphia's household that day. And you've been praying for Onesimus. He served you as part of the household staff and in months previous as you were attending church there. And, and you knew this guy was, was resistant to the gospel. And then you heard about how he stole from Philemon and, and ran away. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that poor guy. So misguided, so lost. He doesn't stand a chance out there. He's probably rotting in some garbage dump even now. You walk into church that morning, and there is Onesimus. Just imagine what that would have done for your heart. Just imagine, you're like, oh my goodness. Oh, it's Onesimus. And, he, and, he's, and he's with a man you know to be an associate of the Apostle Paul. What in the world happened here, Right? What happens at that moment? You realize, you realize that God is sovereign, that God is powerful, that God is, is way bigger than your imagination even. And that somehow on what was the functional equivalent of the other side of the planet, what happened? Onesimus came into contact with Paul. Something incredible has happened here. Christian, keep praying, keep hoping, keep knowing that your God is sovereign and he specializes in bringing prodigals home. 
what may seem hopeless to you may just be the very thing God is using to bring this lost sheep into the fold. The transformation the gospel produces. Thirdly, here this morning, in verses 13 through 16, we see the liberation the gospel gives. Look again with me at verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. Now, in using the term liberation, the liberation the gospel gives, you might assume that I'm of the opinion that Paul is recommending that Onesimus now be set free, that he be manumitted. That's the verb form. Manumission is the releasing of a slave from his or her obligation to serve in that household. Some believe that's Philemon's or Paul's goal here for Onesimus. I tend to think it might be as well. But that's not the liberation I'm talking about here. I'm not referring yet to Onesimus's liberation here, but to Paul's, to Paul's. Now you might ask, well, in what way does Paul need to be liberated? Well, he needs to be liberated from his chains, right? He has been unjustly arrested and he's been drugged through the court system of the Roman Empire, and, and, uh, but here he's still in his chains, physically. But that's not the point I want to draw your attention to here from these verses. I want you to see here how Paul is very free. Paul is free. He is liberated emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Paul is liberated from the need to have his wishes and his ideals realized. He is free to let God be God and direct the situation however God sees fit. Now, Paul has got his wishes here. He expresses them. In verse 13, he says, I would have loved to have kept him on and had him continue to serve me. And in a way, that would have been justifiable. It's as if you yourself were here because he is one of your household. And it may be that Paul is indeed hoping that if he returns to Colossae, which he hopes to do, he says that in the rest of this short little epistle, that he is hoping that Onesimus would be freed to join Paul's missionary team in a way not too unlike his return visit to Lystra, where on the return visit, he picked up Timothy to join him in the team. I I think that might be the, the, the end game here that Paul is wanting to see materialize ideally. But this is key here in this passage. This is, and this is where I think there's some real gold here, if you will, for us today. Paul isn't married to this idea. He's not married to this idea. He is sending Onesimus back to Philemon with no definite strings attached. Why is he willing to do this? Well, as we read on, we keep reading, we see that there's something more important to Paul than his preferences. There's something more important to Paul than his idealized vision of of how this might play out. And that is the reconciliation of Philemon and Onesimus. There's something that's even more important to him than the ethics of it all, though he's trying to honor the ethical component as verse 14 shows us here as well. He wants to see these two brothers in Christ living out that reality now in that household. And if that's going to happen, if, if, if Onesimus and Philemon are going to truly be reconciled in a way that leads to Onesimus staying there forever, that's his terminology in verse 15, then Paul is cool with that. He's saying that would be great. Paul sees any number of scenarios by which God can be glorified in this scenario. He's got his preferences. He's got an idealized vision of of what might be possible here. But his stronger desire is to see God's will done. That's a very liberating way to go through life, isn't it? 
if you think about it. That's our final point here. We, as we think about our wishes, our ideals, our preferences, think this way, Christian. Think kingdom priorities over personal preferences. Kingdom priorities over personal preferences. Why? Well, it's for God's glory, to be sure, that God's will. God, we, we know God knows best, and he's going to get the glory, and that's, that's what's most important, yes. But it's for your own emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being as well. Kingdom priorities. You know, like Paul, we look at our circumstances, and we look at the people in our lives, and we understandably have any number of preferences, any number of ideals, any number of wishes that would be good and could be God-glorifying scenarios. We have them for our children, right? We would love to be able to minister to our children, especially as they grow up and get married. And so we pray for things like, Lord, please keep them nearby, right? That's a preference and that's a legitimate prayer. We have wishes and ideals for our grandchildren. Ideals that we'd love to see realized for them. We have preferences for our friends. We have goals and ideals for ourselves, for our circumstances, for our finances, for our careers, for what we think would be a great way for me to serve the Lord through this particular calling. We have ideals, prayers, and wishes for our nation, don't we? Any number of things we'd love to see happen here in our land. But as Christians, as Christians, we know that God's will is often fulfilled in ways that don't necessarily sync up with our ideals, our preferences, our wishes. Things don't go in the way we had planned, even if we thought that plan could have been a great way to glorify God. And as we accept that, as we learn to think this way, think in terms of kingdom priorities versus our preferences, as we, as we think that way, we find it to be very liberating. It's liberating. It's freeing. It's a liberating way to think and live. After all, to be married to a particular vision or ideal, even a good one, even one that could be God-glorifying, we say, if, if it must play out this way, or I'm not going to be happy, I'm not going to be content. To think that way, to get married to an ideal, can be very enslaving, can't it? You can take a good ideal and turn it into an idol. But as we trust in our sovereign God, as we realize, you know, God, God has a way of doing things, getting his will accomplished, answering that prayer, building his church, but not the way I would have preferred, right? As we, as we accept that, like Paul does here, like Paul is open to here. As we think about the gospel, well, it frees us, doesn't it? It frees us to think in terms of God's big picture and to rest in his sovereignty. It reminds us that all things will work together for good. It reminds us that we can bring our petitions, we can bring our requests before God, but like Paul, we can know that God's sovereign plan can be trusted, even when it doesn't necessarily go with or sync up with our plan A. That's the liberation the gospel gives. How about it then today, Christian? Are your preferences where they should be in your mind and heart this morning? Are you holding them loosely, appropriately? Are you trusting that the all-wise God knows what he is doing as you pray, as you petition, as you make your wishes known? Go ahead and do it. Pour your heart out to him. Let him know what you'd prefer. Paul does it here to Philemon. But remember, just remember, God's kingdom priorities might mean that things don't always go the way you'd hoped. But that's okay. Because nothing can separate you from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, your Lord. Nothing will st stop Christ from building his church. And nothing can thwart God's commitment to bring you all the way home. 
to everlasting bliss with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these perspectives here extracted from this personal letter but so timelessly relevant to right where we are today, Lord. Help us as we go from here to be a people who hear the appeal in your commands, who trustingly obey from the right motivation. Lord, thank you for the gospel's power to transform lives, and I pray that it would continue to transform lives, maybe starting right here in this auditorium, or maybe individuals watching online who, who need to stop running from you. Save them today, we pray, Lord. Open their eyes to the seriousness of their predicament and to the wonders of your amazing grace. And then, Lord, as we go from here, Lord, might we go with a framework, with a mindset that holds our preferences, our wishes, our plans, our plan A's loosely, trusting in the all-wise Sovereign God, who always keeps his promises to his people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you this afternoon. Thank you for joining us here in worship. And we do hope that we'll see many of you, either at youth group or in our house churches, later this evening. You are dismissed. Amen.